Well, I've already given you the heads up. This is going to be somewhat of a searching sermon, challenging sermon. Let me just remind you that as we go through the different aspects of the vows, and I, I should say this as well, and I, I did mention it this morning, probably already this evening, whether we have taken those membership vows or not, we are still called to do that if we're going to follow Jesus because the things we vow are the things He calls us to do. And if we are believers, we do need to obey uh, the Lord Jesus. But we are going to fail in, in virtually every area. We're not going to, as we examine ourselves, find ourselves to be faultless. But let's remember as we're going into this that we're not saved by our obedience. We're saved by the obedience of Jesus Christ. That's what gets us into heaven. But as we see those areas where we do fall short, let's remember the grace of God is not to be an excuse for us to continue to fall short, but rather an encouragement to press on to become more like uh, the Lord Jesus. Uh, in the case of Saul, let's remember one other thing, and we'll come back to that, and, and that is that Saul was not a believer. And so the way the Lord treated him is not going to be the way that he necessarily treats us. Okay, well, let's begin by uh, reading the text, and that would be 1 Samuel 15. And as I did this morning, I want to do here as well, read the whole chapter to get the context, but we're going to be looking mainly at verse 22. So this is what we read. <clears throat> then Samuel said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you as king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore listen to the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he set himself against him on the way when he was coming up from Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and utterly destroy all that he has, and do not spare him, but put to death both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. The Lord was devoting them to destruction, utter destruction. Then Saul summoned the people and numbered them in uh, Telaim. 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 men of Judah. Saul came to the city of Amalek and set an ambush in the valley. Saul said to the Kenites, go, depart, go, uh, go down from among the Amalekites so that I do not destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the sons of Israel when they came up from Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. So Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah as you go to Shur, which is east of Egypt. He captured Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and were not willing to destroy them utterly. But everything despised and worthless, that they utterly destroyed. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel, saying, I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has not carried out my commands. And Samuel was distressed and cried out to the Lord all night. Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul, and it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set up a monument for himself, then turned and proceeded on down to Gilgal. Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. I have carried out the command of the Lord. But Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, but the rest we have utterly destroyed. Then Samuel said to Saul, Wait, and let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And he said to him, Speak. Samuel said, Is it not true? Though you were little in your own eyes, you were made the head of the tribes of Israel. And the Lord anointed you king over Israel. And the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are exterminated. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord, but rushed upon the spoil and did what was evil in the sight of the Lord? Then Saul said to Samuel, I did obey the voice of the Lord and went on the mission which the Lord sent me and have brought back Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took some of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the choicest of the things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God at Gilgal. Samuel said, 
Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination and insubordination is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I have indeed transgressed the command of the Lord and your words because I feared the people and listened to their voice. Now, therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you for you have rejected the word of the Lord. And the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. As Samuel turned to go, Saul seized the edge of his robe and it tore so Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to your neighbor who is better than you. Also the glory of Israel will not lie or change his mind for he is not a man that he should change his mind. Then he said, I have sinned, but please honor me now before the elders of my people and before Israel and go back with me that I may worship the Lord your God. So Samuel went back following Saul and Saul worshiped the Lord. Then Samuel said, bring me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came to him cheerfully. And Agag said, surely the bitterness of death is past. But Samuel said, as your sword has made women childless, so shall your mother be childless among women. And Samuel hewed Agag to pieces before the Lord at Gilgal. Then Samuel went to Ramah. But Saul went up to his house at Gibeah of Saul. Samuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death. For Samuel grieved over Saul, and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. Boy, it's hard to miss the justice of the Lord here, isn't it? I mean, he's devoted an entire people to destruction because of their wickedness. And then you see Samuel do what he did to Agag. Today it's, it's uh, popular to just dismiss, you know, if we can just rehabilitate this murderer, then, then he'll be okay. And we can let him go again. But the Lord said, wait a minute, this person killed another person. His life is forfeit. And that's what the Lord did to Agag. But that, that's not the point this evening. What we're going to look at, of course, is the fact that we need to obey the Lord in, in everything. So first of all, let's just consider a little bit about Saul's life. And let's consider his downward trend. And let's see where his fault actually lay. Now, Saul was God's answer to the people's request for a king. Remember, the Lord had been their king. The Lord was the one who basically ruled them by his word as he ministered it through his prophets and his priests. But the people wanted to be like the other nations. They wanted a king. They wanted somebody to be their figurehead to lead them out to war. And so the Lord gave them a king. Now, the problem, of course, with Saul was that his heart did not belong to God. We do understand the Lord had put his spirit upon him. He empowered him to do some rather great things, but he was an unconverted man. It's been said that Saul was the king that the people wanted. Remember, he was the one who was handsome. He was the one who was a head taller than everyone else. He is someone who had the stature, as it were, the presence of a king. That's what the people wanted. They wanted somebody who was impressive. David was the king that God wanted, a man after his own heart, one who would do all his will. That's what made David uh, to be the kind of person the Lord wanted. But we also need to understand it was really David's greater son, the one that David was a picture of that the Lord was really after and that he was intending to bring through the institution of the office of a king. Now, we should just back up for a minute and, and look at this. Here's another example of how the Lord uses evil for good purposes. I mean, in this case, the sin of his people. It was a sin for them to desire to have a human king like this rather than God as their king. And yet, the Lord used this to bring about his purposes in the end because their demand for a king eventually brought to us our King, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one that we would look to, to fight our battles and to defeat our greatest enemy, and in so doing, 
give us life by the laying down of his life. So they asked for a king, and God gave them a king, and Saul was that king. And Saul, as we know, was trouble almost from the beginning. Again, because he was one that the people wanted, not the one that God necessarily wanted. Now, it's interesting that Saul actually started well. When Nahash the Ammonite, and here again we have another instance of the Ammonites creating difficulty. Remember, the Ammonites are the descendants of Lot, who lived... Um, well, close to, to, um, to Gibeah, or excuse me, not to Gibeah, but to Gilead. Um, when Nahash the Ammonite besieged Jabesh Gilead, and what that means is Jabesh being a town within Gilead, again, the men of the city offered to make a treaty with him. Make a treaty with us, we'll be at peace, everything will be fine. But Nahash agreed only to do so on the condition that he gouge out the right eye of everyone in the city. So they said, let us have three days to think about it. And, and while they were thinking about it, they sent out messengers to see if they could find somebody to help them. Because up until this point, remember, it had just been the judges. There were no kings. Well, when their cry for help reached Saul, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. He gathered an army, and he went out against them, and he struck them down and scattered them throughout the region. Saul had a great victory. There were those who didn't like Saul, didn't want Saul as king, but after Saul had this great victory, he said, bring those men who didn't want me to be king and let's put them to death now because of the Lord has shown that I am his choice. So again, there was one of the uh, perhaps uh, indications that he was in for a fall because pride comes before the fall. So almost immediately after this great victory, he began his downward spiral. First of all, while he was waiting for Samuel to offer a sacrifice before the battle with the Philistines, when Samuel delayed coming, Saul thought he better do it himself. So he intruded into the priestly office. He offered the sacrifices. And for this, the Lord rejected him and told him plainly at that time that he was seeking someone who was after his own heart, who loved him and who would do what is right. So that was already a, a um, you might say, a fatal flaw in Saul's life. His next failure came when he had his army take a foolish oath that they shouldn't eat anything until he had avenged himself on his enemies, the Philistines. And that was basically after the Lord had begun a great victory through his son, Jonathan. Uh, the story of, of Jonathan's faith is, is very encouraging. I remember last week we saw how important it is to trust in the Lord, not only to believe that he can do, but that he will do everything he has said that he would do. We saw last week that this is the kind of person that the Lord is looking for, that he might strongly support them. Well, as he was looking for somebody like this, he found somebody like this in Jonathan. Jonathan was this kind of person. And he thought to himself, as he saw the garrison of the Philistines, the Lord can save through few as easily as he can through many. And even though it was just Jonathan and his armor bearer, he decided to take on the Philistines, trusting that the Lord would give him victory. Of course, if he had reasoned this way, as far as putting his trust in anyone other than the Lord... Um, that faith would have been misplaced. But when you trust in the Lord, he is able to do all that he promised he would do because he is not only trustworthy, he is almighty. There is nothing he cannot do. And because Jonathan trusted the Lord, the Lord blessed him. Again, if we would only trust the Lord more, I think we would see greater things happening in our time. But because Saul had his men take this oath again, even after this victory had begun, they weren't able to eat, and they became tired, and so his enemies survived to fight another day. The Philistines continued to be a thorn in the side of Israel. And we see his final failure in this passage. The Lord had sent him to wipe out the Amalekites, the Amalekites, perhaps you, you're aware, was a nomadic tribe, although sometimes they did settle down. There was apparently a city of the Amalekites, and in this case, 
They had been around for quite some time. They existed from the time of Abraham. But the Lord had devoted them to destruction because when he brought his people out of Egypt, they attacked them along the way on more than one occasion. And the Lord swore that he would wipe them out from under heaven. And now it was time to do so. And so he commissioned Saul to do this. And he was quite clear in what he told Saul to do. We read in verse 3, Now go and strike Amalek and utterly destroy all that he has. And do not spare him, but put to death both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. Sounds to me like it was fairly clear. But Saul, just as clearly, disobeyed the Lord. We read in verses 7 through 9. So Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah as you go to Shur, which is east of Egypt. He captured Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and were not willing to destroy them utterly, but everything despised and worthless, that they utterly destroyed. He failed. When Samuel went to confront him, Saul did not admit that he had failed. As a matter of fact, he joyfully declared, that he had done everything the Lord commanded him to do, that he had accomplished the mission. We read in verses 14 through 21, though, Samuel had a different opinion. But Samuel said, What then is the bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? Doesn't the evidence speak against you, Saul? Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, but the rest we have utterly destroyed. Then Samuel said to Saul, wait and let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And he said to him, speak. Samuel said, is it not true that you were little in your own eyes? When, though you were little in your own eyes, you were made the head of the tribes of Israel. And the Lord anointed you king over Israel. And the Lord sent you on a mission and said, go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are exterminated. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord, but rushed upon the spoil? And did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Then Saul said to Samuel, I did obey the voice of the Lord. And went on the mission on which the Lord sent me. And had brought back Agag, the king of Amalek. And have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took some of the spoil, sheep and oxen. The choicest of the things devoted to destruction. To sacrifice to the Lord your God at Gilgal. It seems like there's a disconnect here, doesn't it? I mean, because it's quite clear what the Lord wanted him to do. What... Samuel was saying, but Saul kept protesting that he had done what the Lord said, even though he clearly did not do. He did part of it. He destroyed the Amalekites. But he didn't do everything that the Lord had commanded. He spared Agag. By the way, Agag is simply the name of the king of the Amalekites. Like Abimelech is the king of the Philistines. Ben-Hadad is the name of the king of the, uh, the Syrians. It, it's just a generic name for their king. He brought back the king. He brought back the best of the animals to sacrifice to the Lord, which under other circumstances might have been a good thing. But in this case, clearly was the wrong thing to do. And this is how Samuel responded and the lesson we are to learn in verses 22 and 23. Samuel said, Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed or listen than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination, and insubordination is as iniquity and idolatry. You're sacrificing to the Lord, but you've rebelled against Him. You haven't done what He's called you to do. Sacrifice is a good thing when it's done in obedience to the Word of God, but when Saul attempted to sacrifice the very thing God commanded him to destroy, his sacrifice really amounted to nothing other than rebellion, which he says was really idolatry. Idolatry because Saul was setting himself up as the standard and, and God, and he was carrying out his own will rather than God's will. So this, this is really the point of the text. This is what the Lord wants us to see. The Lord wants us to listen to him and to do what he says. 
rather than offer him anything in the place of obedience. Now, the question we want to ask ourselves tonight is, have, have we ever done this? <laughs> have we ever followed that example? Have we done something similar to what Saul did? Now, this morning, we considered the importance of keeping our vows, the promises that we have made to the Lord. And we have to really step back and consider, what is it that we have promised him? Well, we have promised the Lord that we will do everything that he calls us to do. And again, whether we made that vow or not, those are the conditions by which we come to Jesus. We don't just, we come to him as we are, yes we do, but then we, we repent of our sins and we follow him. These are the conditions of discipleship, of being a believer, whether we vow them or not. If we're following Jesus, this is what he calls us to do. And the question is, is that what we're actually doing? Or are we doing something else? Maybe something that's good. You know, Saul tried to do something good, but it wasn't exactly what the Lord wanted. It wasn't what he called him to do. Well, our Lord calls us um, as we promise, and I want to use those, those membership vows to sort of frame what I'm going to say here. Uh, he calls us, and we promised to do this, to submit to his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and that, of course, would be a summary of really everything he calls us to do. But we promised to submit to him. We promised that we would forsake the world. We promised that we would resist the devil. We promised we would put our sins to death and that we would live a godly life, that we would follow the example of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the question this text asks us this evening, is that the goal that we have been striving after? The one that we've been working hard to attain in the way that we actually said we would with everything that is within us. That's actually how the vow is, is worded. Well, our Lord tells us that that's what we should do. Remember what the Apostle Paul tells us. We should be like an athlete that is, that is competing in a competition that is seeking to win the prize. We are to run in such a way that we may win. We should box as those that are not just beating the air. We need to have that goal. We need to seek to be the one, as it were, who wins the race. That's the kind of effort we are to put into living the Christian life and pursuing what it is the Lord has called us to pursue. That's actually what we promise the Lord we would do. So are we doing that or have we replaced this goal? And by the way, these things come from my own experience as well as I know it's our own experience and what I see in the churches around us. So just because one happens to be saying these things doesn't mean that this person is, is certainly perfect. I'm certainly not perfect. So this is a question. That's why I use the word we, okay? Have we replaced this goal? with a more comfortable kind of Christianity, the kind that we see in most people who profess faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the kind that doesn't stand out, the kind that doesn't speak out, the kind that sort of blends in with what everybody else is doing. You know, to put this in, in sort of other terms, are we, are we sort of cruising around in, in stealth mode or are we driving you know, our lives with our bright beams on. You know, that's, that's what the Lord wants us to do. He wants us to shine. He wants us to stand out. But we tend to stand back and blend in and not stand out. Are we pursuing what the Lord has actually called us to do or are we replacing what he calls us to do with something else? Our Lord calls us and, and we have promised to be faithful in, in our worship. Uh, that's one of the, uh, the membership vows as well, that we will... Uh, we will be attending the worship services to be present with the people of God when we meet together for worship and not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, which, of course, we're all here this evening, so that's, that's a good thing. But again, I would ask, is that what we're doing? Maybe some are tuning in at this particular juncture or maybe are listening online. Is that what we're doing? Meeting together to worship the Lord. Or do we, have we sort of come to the conclusion that public worship really isn't necessary? That maybe it's good to make a service if we can make it, but we really don't need to make two services. And you know, that is the mindset today. It's like, well, I can worship the Lord at home. I can worship Him privately. I don't need to meet together. 
The problem with that, though, is that that's not what the Word of the Lord says. God tells us that we shouldn't forsake the assembling of ourselves together. When the people of God meet together and we're able to be here, we should be here. And then we need to ask the question about Wednesday nights when we meet together for Bible study and, and prayer meeting because this also is a part of the church's worship, isn't it? And the discipleship that's supposed to be the ongoing thing. It's, it's, you know, it's not Sunday. We know Sunday is important. It's the Lord's Day and we need to meet together to worship Him. But a lot of this is discipleship as well. But we're doing some pretty important things on Wednesday. And the question is, do we, already need, do, we, do we already know everything we need to know? We don't really need to learn anything more? Do we really not need to pray? Are those things not important? And we need to ask, have we substituted something for what the Lord would have us to do? And then we might ask about the service of the church because the service of the church is, is something we've also vowed to be participating in. Now, we may, not, we may argue that it's not that important to maintain the property. You know, it's, it's physical, it's not spiritual, right? Does it really matter what, what our meeting place looks like, you know, to, to us? Well, it may matter to the people who, who visit us because this is where we worship. And where we worship does reflect something about us and certainly... And more importantly, it reflects something about the Lord. Now, I'd be the first one to admit that this is probably the ugliest facility that I've ever seen. But it should be a well-maintained, ugly facility, right? If, if we're going to honor the Lord, right? We need to do the very best that we can with it. But we know the service of the church goes even beyond maintaining the property. It includes evangelism. It includes missions. It includes diaconal work. And we've promised to support these things as well. And we need to ask ourselves the question, is that what we're doing? Are we even thinking along those lines? Are we, are we seeking to contribute in, in ways that we can contribute? The Lord doesn't expect us to do it all ourselves, of course. We can't. But there are some things we, we can do. And then we ask ourselves the question about Another one, another one of the reasons why the Lord actually calls us to meet together as He does and why we just don't meet in separate homes and worship where we are because we need to support and serve one another with the gifts that the Lord has given to us. That's what He calls us to do in Scripture. And so are we paying attention to the needs of those who are around us and doing what we can to meet those particular needs? Another question we may ask, and again, we may be being faithful in these things or we may not. We need to let the Lord judge and we need to do before the Lord what he calls us to do. But we also need to ask this question, what about the finances of the church? One of the things that the elders do with just about everyone they interview for membership is ask them whether they're intending on tithing. And virtually all of them say yes. I'm not sure if, if how many of them actually know what that means, but a tithe means giving a tenth of all the Lord has blessed us with in order to support the work of the church. And that's what the Lord calls us to give him in Scripture. So the question is, again, is that what we're doing or have we substituted something other? Maybe what we're giving is, is good, but the question is whether it's what the Lord has called us to give. We promise the Lord that to do what he calls us to do. And as we've just heard, to obey him is better than any sacrifice that we might want to substitute in its place. Now, the same thing is true with regard to the promises that we make to one another. The Lord calls us, as we saw this morning as well, to be true to our word, not just in our vows, but in everything that we say. We need to keep our promises. If we say we're going to do something, we need to do it. And... Several of us here have made promises like that to one another. Husbands, you and I, we promised our Lord that we would love our wives as Jesus loves the church. Wives, you promised your, the Lord that you would submit to your husbands as the church submits to Christ. Parents, you know, we promised our Lord that we would raise our children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. And we need to ask ourselves again, is that what we're doing? Now, in some cases, our parenting may be over. Our children are already adults. But the question is, is that what we did when we had that opportunity? There's nothing we can do to go back and change it. 
But is that what we did? If not, we need to ask the Lord for his mercy, and he will certainly grant it to us. But we do need to continue to pray for those children if they're adults and they're not walking with the Lord, that the Lord might yet have mercy on them. Our Lord wants us to fulfill our promises, and he wants us to do it from the heart. He doesn't want us just to go through the motions. He wants us to do it out of a spirit of love. He wants us to worship him with our whole lives and to devote ourselves completely to him. We were just talking about the, the Nazarite this morning and how really Jephthah devoted his daughter to the Lord's service. I don't think that Jephthah burned his daughter alive. Again, remember I said earlier that um, that was the vow upon which, the basis upon which God actually gave Jephthah the deliverance that he did from the Ammonites and gave him that victory. Do you think the Lord was going to answer Jephthah if Jephthah was saying, Lord, give me this victory and I will take one of the members of my household and just burn them into ashes? The Lord hates human sacrifice. That's not what Jephthah called him to do. He devoted his daughter to the Lord. But that is exactly what the Lord calls us to do, is to devote ourselves entirely to the Lord. We may not have somebody doing it for us. The Lord wants us to do that, and that is, as a matter of fact, what we did when we came to the Lord. We devoted ourselves to Him not just on Sundays, not just on Wednesday nights. Did you hear the, in the, uh, the song that we listened to in, uh, beforehand? He wants us to give ourselves entirely to Him. He wants us to love one another genuinely. He wants us to be patient with one another and not merely tolerate one another. He wants us to support the ministry through our giving and through our service. And we need to ask ourselves, is this what we're doing? Or have we substituted our own religion for what the Lord actually calls us to do? Now, as I've said at the beginning, this indicts all of us, okay? The sad fact is that's what we've all done. We, we've all substituted some things for what the Lord calls us to do. None of us have measured up to his standard. If we could, we, we wouldn't need Jesus. The only one who has measured up is the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's remember this, that the good news is, this is the gospel, Jesus laid down his life to cleanse us from all of those sins. Because of his obedience and his death, we will see heaven. That is the gospel. But at the same time, we need to remember that he did these things also that he might give us his Holy Spirit so that we would have the power to fight against our sins, so that we would have the power to obey him, so that by his grace we might become more like him. And that is what the Lord has promised that he will do if we keep looking to him to do it. But again, the point is, we need to be aware of what it is we're supposed to be doing, and we need to be asking the Lord to give us the grace to do that. Now, in closing, I just want to think about this as by way of encouragement, because as we read this, this story about Saul, we might think, hey, one, one mistake and you're out, because look at, look at what happened to Saul, right? Uh, it, it almost, I mean, it appears as though David may have blown it worse than he did, and yet David didn't he wasn't treated in the same way. So let's think about this. Why did the Lord reject Saul for his failures, but he didn't reject David for his, even though David had to face very serious consequences? And I think the answer is because David belonged to the Lord, but Saul didn't belong to the Lord, which means that Saul was still under the covenant of works. David was under the covenant of grace. All it would take to destroy Saul would simply be one failure. And we know that he already came into the world with, with one big failure, and that was Adam's sin, and he had committed many more sins than that. But when the Lord set this up with Saul, it didn't take much before he rejected him. But it almost seemed like no amount of failure on David's part moved the Lord to reject him. And the good news is, is simply this, that the Lord is not going to reject you either or me for our failures if we have trusted in the Lord. We need to remember that he loves us and he is never going to let go of us. So let's not let this love that he shows us and that he has for us become an excuse 
to fail or to continue to substitute what we want for what the Lord wants, but rather let's use it as a motive uh, to, to move us to obey the Lord in the way that, that we know He wants us to obey Him. Well, let's, uh, let's bow our heads for a moment of prayer and let's, let's ask for the Lord's help to do that.